Welcome to episode 362 of We Don't Die Radio. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And this is a special video episode. So if you are listening right now and you'd rather be watching, you can go to YouTube and type in We Don't Die Radio 362. As a reminder, our home base is wedontdie.com, and there you can find actually over 400 episodes between this show, We Don't Die Radio, and then my new show, which is on iHeartRadio and Coast to Coast AM called Shades of the Afterlife. This show is a little different because here we can really explore one topic with one guest, whereas the other show, we cover lots of things in one hour episode. Also, wedontdie.com is our free weekly Sunday gathering, which of course has a medium demonstration in each and every one. And we're there to give inspiration and comfort, evidence of the afterlife, but also some tools to live life. So question for you, what would it be like to know the answers to questions like, what is consciousness? What happens after we die? Are God, Jesus, heaven, and angels real? Well, our guest today had an extraordinary near-death experience, and she'll be sharing some of those answers with us. Meet Meet Janet Tarantino, who is the author of Dying to See, Revelations about God, Jesus, Our Pathways, and the Nature of the Soul. You can find out more about Janet at JanetTarantino.com. Janet, a warm welcome to our we Don't Die Radio slash video episode. Hi. Thank you, Sandra. That's great. I'm so honored to be here and excited. I'm just excited to tell my story so people know the answers to those questions. Oh, I love it. Well, I'm excited too. I sprang it on you last minute. How about doing a live video episode? And you said yes, so you're my kind of gal. So we love it. And you know what? People listen when we can just be ourselves. So I think it's perfect that nothing's rehearsed and you and I haven't spent time together before. So I don't know your story. So mm-hmm. where, first of all, where are you in the world? Right now? I'm in uh, Windsor, Colorado, which is up near Fort Collins, Colorado, about an, uh, 45 minutes to an hour north of Denver. Oh, beautiful. And I'm on the East Coast of the United States, about an hour and a half south of Boston, Massachusetts, in Rhode Island with my mom. So you know your story better than anyone, if you wouldn't mind just taking us on your journey. Oh, sure. Uh, So first, I'd like to mention uh, that I had a career as a network coordinator. So my entire position was analyzing, analyzing, and analyzing. But what I didn't realize was that those skills were given to to me for a much higher purpose. And that was for what is to lie ahead. And in hindsight, I found out, find it, it found it interesting that even back then uh, I was being groomed for speaking because periodically the corporate management would fly in to hear presentations from those of us who were able to meet our expectations so outstandingly. And I remember specifically shaking like a leaf when I was up before all these managers uh, giving my uh, presentation. Uh, But now it's my passion. I didn't think I could do it, but it was my passion now. So when I laid out the planning of my book, I looked back on my life and realized that a number, I had a number of unusual moments in my life. And back then I discounted them as a lot of people do because I couldn't make sense of them. So I shoved them aside. And I always thought about these types of supernatural experiences only happening in biblical times. Uh, And this is the here and now after all. So I, you know, set them aside. And in those times, I had never heard of a near-death experience, and spirituality was not in my family sphere, uh, with the exception of my grandmother, who was known to give card readings uh, with a regular deck of cards and tea leaves. Um, I understand she was pretty good. However, I didn't have the chance to spend much time with her because she passed uh, or transitioned over when I was in middle school. But I do remember specifically, um, I would oftentimes get a little cup of coffee uh, or tea, whatever it was. And would you please uh, read my grounds, Grandma? 
And I remember one time she said, sure. And she had the cup in front of her and uh, she looked at it and then she threw it over her shoulder. And I don't, I, I wouldn't always wondered if she was seeing my near death experiences in the future and she didn't want to tell me. So yeah, I just thought about that. And so now let's get to the goodies of what happened to me. Uh, I'd like to start by telling everyone that I, uh, God told me to write this book dying to see and he told me to make it about him uh, so i'll tell everyone a, a little later more about that portion of it but i wanted to, so you know where the book came from and i would also like to mention since i grew up christian i often refer to god as the he or him but he's the ultimate energy of unbound love that has no gender but i i figured it's easier to refer to him as a he rather than an it it just doesn't seem personal enough for me. Uh, so I invite it, listeners to please substitute their terminology uh, that they prefer uh, for the I am. So please give me a little bit of leeway in describing it this way, because we're one super body, that's for sure. And we never die. You're right, Sander. So um, I would like to touch on that. I re I'm going to touch on these moments because there's so many of them, some of them in reduced form, but I'm the, the big one, I'm going to get into more detail. And uh, God showed me moments of my life in mini movie uh, fashion. Uh, so these portions, what I'm going to share with you, are part of those movies, not all but part. So what I discovered that each moment layered upon each other to create a bigger picture of how the creator works in all of our lives. And however, when it comes to most, the most intense, like I said, I'll give more information. So let's go to the time when I was pre-kindergarten age, about four or five uh, years old. And um, I, when I had a, some precognitive visions, I remember the day clearly because I was bored. I was home from school because I wasn't old enough to go to school and all the kids weren't home. I'd had nobody to play with. And my mom was on the telephone uh, talking to a friend about adoption. And so when she got off the phone, I inquired, I said, am I your little girl? I mean, am I adopted? And she said, no, you're our little girl. And uh, so that satisfied that inquiry, but I told her, okay, but I'm going to die young. And of course she was shocked as any mother would be. And she said, quit talking about that, like that. And uh, when I set, stood there, uh, I had no idea what age was because I was so young. And uh, that's when I had three visions flash by in front of me. And those visions ended up being the ages of my three near-death experiences that were going to happen in the future. So there are certain moments of our life that are planned. And this supports uh, a biblical verse in Psalms that says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out. Uh, before a single day was passed. But what I'd like to point out in that scripture is every moment, it doesn't say every second, what God specifically showed me were movie moments of my life. So not everything is planned, but there are certain lessons that will, will occur. And uh, that those were significant to my life journey. And uh, it's also important that every choice we make can take us down a different pathway. But like I said, there's certain moments, certain lessons that will happen no matter what pathway we take, but they may manifest differently, harder in one way versus the other way. Um, the first NDE was when I was 15 years old and I became very ill. My mom was worried, so she slept in bed with me so she could, of course, take care of me. And when I woke up during the night, uh, while lying in bed, I looked up at the ceiling uh, light that had been turned off for the night. And I felt like death warmed over and you can smell that sweet, sour smell of sweat, you know, and I had a strange buzzing vibration in my head and uh, still looking up at the light. I felt dizzy, but I was laying in bed, but, and I had the strange sensation that I not only fell back through the mattress, I fell out of my body too, which I did. My spirit had left my body. And then in spirit form, when I looked up toward the ceiling, I saw the ceiling transform into all bubbling clouds. Everything was just bubbling clouds. 
And then in two separate areas of those clouds, there were uh, quickly mo spinning motions that created two uh, other holes that uh, to two other worlds. When peering through the opening to the left, I saw a sumo wrestler uh, with a top knot in his hair. That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> in a white room surrounded in a white light radiant white light and all he did was watch me uh, no matter how he moved he kept his eyes on me watching and i then uh i heard the most beautiful music coming from the other tunnel and so my attention went there and that's when i saw the most beautiful stunning young woman with long thick almost black hair swished down into the opening she had a white gown of lace on and she seemed to have the come riding in on that music, it's beautiful. At the time, I thought of her as daddy's little girl and the music box lady, the music because of the, the music that she came riding in and, and uh, because she was, I just thought of her as daddy's little girl because she moved up in a way at one point in time and I thought of daddy putting her up on a pedestal. And after she made her entrance, she started communicating with the sumo wrestler. And I knew they were discussing something, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. But when their discussion ended, the two beings magically transformed into orbs of light and left the room. One bobbed up and down in the side window while the other one left. I, that must have been the sumo wrestler that was watching me, you know. <laughs> and then when the other one came back, then they both left. And that's when I settled back down into my body and uh, then we ran to the bathroom to throw up. And afterwards, I just, that's the one I really discounted and I couldn't make sense of that at all. But I found out much later that the sumo wrestler is my guide. His name is Fung. Uh, and, and these guy types of guides are also referred to in the Bible as angelic watchers or angelic observers. We all have an angelic master guide and the sumo wrestler was mine. When I, I initially saw him, what really was confusing, he was moving in fast speed, uh, like a film flipping over at the end. Right. And uh, so I couldn't make sense of that. But then when we were in the same dimension, uh, then he became normal speed. So he was at much higher frequency, uh, fast speed before I joined him in that dimension. And then the music box lady. Oh, I got to show you this one. I drew pictures of everything that I that I saw. That's great. Yeah, and, and they're in my book. The music box lady was my daughter, who was not to be conceived or born until 15 years later. And I obviously had an agreement with her to be her mom. And if she if I died that night, she wouldn't have been born. And at some level, I must have had knowledge that this was going to happen and that was why i referred to her as daddy little daddy's little girl and any conversation that i might have been included in on was erased from my mind uh, because it wouldn't have been good for me but here is here's my daughter and here's the music box lady that i drew wow yeah beautiful <laughs> uh, uh. But if I had remembered, you know, retained that knowledge, I probably would have all likely always wondered if I was picking the right man to be the father of that daughter. So they were letting it play out the way that that uh, um, to my to my choice. Right. Maybe she would have been my daughter with no matter who I was going to be with. I don't I don't know. But this encounter reveals that we we work with other souls during our, our lifetime, our, during our life journey. And then the second NDE happened when I was involved in a severe car accident. This was when I was in my late thirties. So these things were so far apart. I you know, made no connection to them until I made the planning of this book, but uh, I was saved by divine intervention. And, and that accident pushed the awareness my awareness open so I could no longer discount these experiences and, and these the presence of invis invisible things around us. And I call this incident the uh, ultimate ambush makeover. It's oh, a great term. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I not a great working. experience, but yeah, I know these things are not easy. No, you, right? can't They're imagine. Not easy. Uh, um, so be careful what you wish for, I right. guess. 
So at the time I was still working in my longtime career at, at this corporation as a network coordinator and a single mom of three at that time. And my parents lived over 800 miles away. So I was, I was on my own when it came to taking care of the kids. And they asked if they could have the children for a month. Yay, you know, <laughs> a, month, a little, yes. little bit of time for myself. And uh, so all I had to do was get, get the kids there. So we did, we went on a vacation. And then um, after I delivered them, uh, then I returned home. But I didn't know this was God's way of getting my children out of the way for what was going to happen, this car accident. And then after delivering the children, uh, like I said, I returned to, to Denver. I lived in Denver at that time. And I had, I, I wanted to use the weekend to, to get flowers and decorate my, my deck uh, so it would look good for the children when they returned home. And so I was looking forward to that day of planting and I drove to the flower nursery and got all my supplies. On my way home, there was virtually no traffic at the time. And there were cars behind me, but they were far enough away that they weren't of a concern. And there was three lanes going in each direction. And I was in the middle lane and I noticed I was catching up to the car in front of me faster than I should, but I wasn't speeding. And that's when I noticed the car was stopped at the bottom of the hill in the middle lane, the same lane that I was in. And the strange thing was that there was no cross street there, no uh, light for uh, pedestrians. It was, there was just no reason for him to be stopped there. And I didn't know what was going on. So I evaluated, analyzed the situation. And there was a, a park on the left side in a grassy area on the right. And I was concerned as to whether a child had come out in the road and I, if it was in front of that car, I didn't know which direction it would be going. So I, I decided to stop behind that vehicle. And then I glanced in my rear view mirror and I noticed the light at the top of the hill had changed and a mass of cars was racing down the hill toward us. I mean, it was really, it was like horses, horses running toward the finish line. And all the lanes were filled and I knew no one could deviate from their lane. And the speed zone in that area was 45 to 50 miles an hour. It was in that That's range. Fast. So uh, I saw the pickup truck that behind me and he was looking to the right and I knew he didn't see we were stopped and I knew he was going to hit me. And I, I had the thought about uh, my seatbelt. I hadn't buckled my seatbelt because uh, I was only a block away from the flower nursery and I knew I didn't have time to put it on. Uh, that's when in desperation, you know, I called out in my mind, oh God, he's going to hit me. And instantaneously, I heard a voice. I was the only one in the car. Give me instructions on what to do. And I did as I was told. And as that accident took place, I then felt the aid of, a, of what was provided. I knew God sent helped me because I felt the arms of an invisible being picking me up like a child uh, as that collision unfolded. And after being picked up, I found myself looking down on the accident scene through a hole in the clouds. And even though it was a cloudless day, so that cloud, that, those, that cloud I was looking through is obviously the veil that separates one dimension from another, which we, we can't ordinarily see in this world. Right. Yeah. So um, all the while I was in that dimension, though, I felt uh, the ever so light touch, you know, of an, of an angelic hand on my back of my uh, arms above the elbow, gently holding me there as I floated. And I watched this accident unfold. And uh, this experience also showed me that our, our calls for assistance are answered when it doesn't alter what we're here to learn or pre a preordained exit point. Um, obviously, that was not my exit point, but I, this is all building up to something else. So unlike that first NDE, uh, where I was looking from this dimension into another one, this time I was looking from that dimension into this one through a hole in the cloud. So I knew what happened, but I couldn't tell anybody. I mean, who is going to believe me, you know, really? So I stayed light, uh, silent and carried this on. But after this ac accident, this, uh, uh, this scripture in Psalm, I love Psalms, um, 
but call to me in times of trouble and I will save you and you will honor me. But that's not the only moment that shows that our prayers are answered. Sometimes they're answered in faces. The third NDE, this is the big one, which I'll get into more detail, was unquestionably created in a way that I would know it was the answer to my prayer that I had prayed two, pre two years previous to when it happened at the Pepsi event center. Um, and so between the, the second NDE though and the third NDE, my world fell apart. Let's cover that, let's we'll touch on that. That's where the, uh, the ambush makeover was, was happening after the accident, but it was six years after the accident and nothing, there was no reason for it. Everything in my life was wonderful. I loved my job, uh, my, I loved my work family and I had gotten married. And during this time frame, I felt like I was being erased by some unseen force and the doctors couldn't figure out what was causing it. Uh, almost overnight, I started to stutter. My hand shook so badly I couldn't write my name. The electrical shock started snapping like lightning bolts all over my body and were causing me to slap you know, myself where the bolt struck and that included my face. Wow. Yes, and I, I can you imagine how it felt? I mean, I even could not relate uh, the, I could see something in my mind and I couldn't put the word to it. So I really had a hard time communicating. But can you imagine what I looked like when I was in a product planning meeting and I slapped my arm? Well, I could, you know, I could brush that off, you know, yeah, pretend like that it was something else. But how can you pretend that it's something else when you slap your own face? Oh my gosh, <laughs> can you imagine? It was so, it was rather embarrassing. I but back. I look back at, at it with humor now. So, um, and I didn't have any more bath, math abilities and uh, the mere act of thinking hurt. Um, I believe that that was a way of making me live in the now in my heart instead of my analytical mind. Uh, so you, you, everybody thinks that coincidences are, uh, you know, just happen periodically, uh, but they're, they really are, they're no accidents. Some things are meant to be. And that was where God was making me into the person who would honor him. Because in the near-death experience uh, that this goes to, he showed me a sign over that time frame of my life with under construction. He, he's, got, he's got quite a humor. So, uh, but this coincidence, it, which is not a coincidence, uh, happened with when my husband was got a call from his cousin um, who he hadn't seen for I have no idea how long. Uh, and his cousin said he was coming to town and would be at the Pepsi Center, Pepsi Zent Center for an event. And he offered to give us tickets so we could come and we could visit uh, while we were there. And I had never met him, so I was anxious to go. Uh, come to find out the event was a speaking engagement for a pastor who was supposedly well known and was known to heal people, but I had never heard of this pastor. Uh, but when I found out about his healing, I thought uh, the doctors couldn't figure this out. Oh, you know what's going on? Who could better to turn to than Jesus? So the pastor gave a very motivational and inspiring talk as we were there. And uh, while I in the crowd sang songs, we sang songs like Jesus, you're all I need. He touched me. Uh, he's the savior of my soul and, and breathe upon me, breath of God. Those are the ones that uh, are really pertain to my near death experience. And I prayed with my entire being for a healing and uh, I felt um, a fairy godmother, like a fairy godmother's ma magic wand touched me on the top of the head. And he touched me, you know, just mm -hmm. like that song said. And I got some of my math abilities back as things started to improve. So this was phase one of the prayer that I had prayed. But the, the answer to my total prayer comes in this near-death experience. Because you don't realize when you're singing songs and you're praying, you're singing songs with the words of the song, you know, and so I was praying for God to heal my soul, 
And that's what he did in this next one. Um, as I mentioned, I got married and my husband Gavin and I moved to the country because he enjoyed country life. And one fall season, I developed an allergy, which near-death experiences are, are known to develop sensitivities to things. And mm -hmm. uh, this was a sensitivity that I didn't know I had. And it it felt like an allergy because it congested me so badly. And I had to use inhalers and um, and everything. But at the end of the day, I would go inside and take decongestants to clear up my sinuses. But one night the congestion was extremely bad. And when I went to bed, I propped pillows, you know, three pillows on top of each other so that I could be at a 45 degree angle. And I fell asleep with my hands over my tummy on my back. During the night, my chest started hurt uh, because my breathing had been cut off. I also didn't have enough energy to sit up and gasp for air. I reached for my husband with my left hand and I couldn't feel him. And I, I yelled for him. I said, Gavin, help me, please help me. But he continued to sleep. There was no response. Suddenly I found myself instantaneously without effort out of my body. And I felt like I had been set free. I felt like I had taken, taken the biggest, freshest breath of air that I'd ever had. And I was floating in a velvety darkness of unconditional peace, love, and tranquility. I felt like the most, it felt like the most magnificent spa day ever times a million. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. And I was instantly connected to the universal consciousness. And I knew everything was as it should be. I looked down on myself and I could see my husband and I lying in the bed below. When I looked down on myself, I saw that I was still on my back and my hands were still over my tummy. I knew I was dead. And I was surprised, of course, what I looked like from this perspective. But because my hands were still over my head, over my tummy rather, I knew that it was my spirit arm that reached for him. And it was my spirit voice that called for him. And that's oh, why he, I didn't feel him. And that's why he didn't respond. I wanted to see more of my physical body. I was curious. And just by that desire, I found myself zooming in to see my body from different directions. Then I returned to above. And that's when I looked around and I noticed that the ceiling had melted away and was no longer there. And at the time, I felt like I was floating face up in an, in an immense pool of love at a 45 degree angle with my head up. And I could feel my energetic arms elongated and floating out to my side. They were elongated because they were no longer encapsulated in the physical body. And I saw a silver cord float by in very slow motion in an atmosphere with no gravity. When I saw the silver cord float by, I noticed a ball of light approaching in a slight S-shaped curve uh, from the distance coming toward me. The movement of that light reminded me of, of the Roadrunner cartoon. Yeah. yeah. Runner. It was like the Roadrunner zipping up a little S-shaped curve towards the mm -hmm. Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> but this time he stops in front of me. But I was, he hadn't got to me yet at this point. I was more interested in what was going down, happening below because I saw some activity down at my physical body. And so I looked down and I noticed something blue, the color of the sky on a beautiful day, lifting up out of my feet and then up out of my ankles and my shins and then up out of my thighs. And as that, as that started, uh, exiting the body, I knew that that was my portion of God's spirit, uh, known as the Holy Spirit. And I, my consciousness, was the spirit that had already left the upper part of the body. And I was now watching the remaining part of my spirit leave the lower half of my body. I had stretched to escape the physical form. So somehow, because I, like I said, I was connected, this thing started floating up to me and I, I actually zoomed down and watched it 
lift up out of my body from the waist. And then I went back up to the ceiling, but then it started drawing up toward me. So when it, when it drew up to me, I became one form again, and I became a, an orb of light. Uh, as I transformed, I could feel my energetic arms that were floating out pull in, and I saw that energy pull up, and then I, that's when I transformed into an orb shape. And I was sitting in a wand of love. Breathe upon me, breath of God. So while the, while the metamorphosis took place, um, that's when I, I transformed. And I was glowing. I was a glowing ball of light. And I, uh, I was amazed that I no longer needed glasses that I needed so badly. I had to, I had to feel for them in the morning uh, because I couldn't see uh, that, that well until I would get my contacts on it. Everything that ailed me was gone. I felt perfect again. And uh, suddenly that's when the, the Roadrunner light zips in and stops in front of me. And it promptly transforms into an incredible heavenly light being that was infused with light and had light rays coming out of its heart center. Initially, I could see the, the brown hair, uh, actually it was a little bit longer than mine. And I could see that the, um, the strands of hair were going across with being blown across its chin, but I could not make out the portion of his face because the rays of light from his heart center were, so, were obstructing my view and mine as well. However, uh, during this experience and after this, it's revealed that this light was Jesus. So Jesus was in front of me and he loved me. He loved me no matter, irregardless of my successes or my failures, he loved me just for being. He loved me without condition, and he loves everybody the same. Um, he, if, if I had to describe what he looked like, this is, he looked like, have you ever seen a, a, Kane, a Kane Kramerick's Prince of Peace painting? Uh, he looked just like that. And the, that's the painting that she created when she was eight years old. And, oh, yes, yes, yes. I have uh, seen it. Yep, yeah, yep. it was divinely inspired. That's who I saw. That's who I saw. And he had, uh, brown, like I said, brown hair down to, his chia, down to his shoulders. And he wore a floor length gown of white. And it uh, had a rope tied around its waist uh, with the excess hanging down the front of his gown. Um, the, the sleeves were gently hanging from his wrists. And he had his arms open wide in, in a, of course, a welcoming gesture. And I was in awe of who I was seeing. And I just was like gaped, you know, I, I couldn't speak because I was just in awe and I felt like I could just burst because I, I, you know, I loved him too. I could feel his love and I could, we were exchanging love. And in the meantime, I noticed another ball of light coming from the left through the darkness. And, but I turned my focus back to Jesus because he put his right hand out to me in a palm up in a gesture, you know, like, come take my hand. And then that's what he said, it's time to come home, Jan. When he told me that, it, I would, thought of my daughter, Gina, because we're very close. I have two sons too, but she, she was the first one that I thought of uh, because we're so close. And I wondered how she'd take my death, but my thought was answered without having to ask because Jesus said, she'll be okay. Suddenly, the second light that uh, uh, had grown grander, it was now beside Jesus. And I could see the, the clouds bubbling around the edges of the glowing light. And the clouds seemed to create a cornucopia effect. Uh, effect. But this light was actually alive. And it was made of the purest, untainted, unconditional love that can't be fathomed. And this magnificent force of energy was God in all of his essence. And I can honestly say we're loved unconditionally, no matter who we are. And even though to me, the light rays seemed to be white, uh, I could feel, I could sense 
the, the magnificent rays of color coming out of it. And that's when God reached out his energetic arms and he embraced me. He told me I was perfect in every way. And while he held me, he showed me many movie moments of my life and told me, understand these moments, they matter. Some of the moments I recognized and I shared with, with you today, but some I didn't because they hadn't happened yet. Mm. This was not a life review. This was something else. As you can imagine, I didn't want to go back to my body, but God had other plans for me. He wanted me to stay in the earthly world but he was giving me a choice uh, because I didn't still didn't want to go back to my physical body. Angels came for me. And this time, just like when I morphed into an orb of light, I transformed into a translucent figure of a person, white, a white one, actually, this one. Because of this different metamorphosis, it proves that our spirit can change into anything it desires. It can manifest as a person. It can manifest however it wants to. Uh, the angels gently again touched the back of my arms above my elbows and lifted me high into the sky above the ranch. I could see the inside of the ranch, the outside of the ranch uh, and um, everything. Uh, I was shown that I would discover my husband would discover my dead body. I had become one with the universe in that. I was everywhere at the same time. I could see the ambulance coming up the road. I could hear the crunch of the tire like, I, like my ear was next to the tire, even though I was so high in the sky. I felt like I was riding in the vehicle and I could hear the clunks of the equipment uh, knocking around in the ambulance. Uh, even though I was still in the sky, I could see down the road and behind the ambulance as if I was the driver too, but I was still up in the sky. I was everywhere uh, at the same time. That's because our spirit is our portion of God's spirit. And just like the creator, our spirit can be in all places at all times. So our spirit is a portion of God. Because I still wanted to go to my real home in heaven, I immediately was down again in front of the light of God. And I was just on that precipice of entering that light when I was shown another image. And that was important to me because it was an image of my middle son, Kurt. And when I saw his picture, I knew something was going to happen in the future. And if I wasn't there to support him, his life would go down a pathway that would not be so good for him. So how would I know this? Unless I, there, it was planned. And I must have had some kind of agreement with Kurt to be there to support him through this troubling time. So again, we have agreements with other spirits. That's when I made my decision to stay and I told Jesus I'm not ready to go yet. And Jesus smiled and nodded his head. And that's when I turned back into the blue spirit body. And I sat down in Jan's body. I put my butt in her butt. I slipped a spirit foot into one leg and another spirit foot into the other. And not with completely because then when I sat down and I put my spirit hands on my spirit knees and I rocked back and forth until I, this, its consciousness, its energy, its soul get enough momentum to lay down, snap back in and help Jan sit up and gasp for air. And all the while I re-entered my body, I heard a voice from heaven echoing over and over again until I completely entered it. And that echoing message is not only for me, but it's for everyone. And that voice kept repeating, love is the only thing that matters. Love is the only thing that matters. So needless to say, Jan, now me, was able to sit up and gasp for air. And then she lived her life wondering when the other shoe was going to drop for her son, Kurt. Well, can I ask you a couple questions before you sure. go on? Mm -hmm. I, I'm riveted on the edge of my seat. First of all, how clear was that memory of those experiences, like you rocking back and forth? I mean, can you picture it like it just happened? Oh, yeah. 
yeah, when I tell the story, I'm reliving, reliving it all over again. And I love that story because it, 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 if it's our spirit that gives this body the energy for this body to move forward. They work in tandem with each other. And, and if, if, if this body didn't have a spirit or soul, it wouldn't be able to function. It'd be, it'd be dead. It wouldn't exist. And that's why the spirit leaves the body upon the, you know, the failure of the, of the body. So, yeah. I ask, oh, sorry. I ask that because I've interviewed other people that have had near death experiences and, you know, some of us can't remember what we had for breakfast yesterday, but people that have had a near death experience at the age of like 12 can remember it like it was just yesterday. So that's yeah. important. And I, I love what you said about vision. I'm somebody who always had bad vision. I couldn't see without glasses and I have had laser eye surgery. So now I can see, but I know uh, Dr. Ken Ring has done so much research on people who've had near death experiences that were blind and they could see for the very first time. Amazing. I never thought of that actually, because mm -hmm. in the physical, I couldn't see. It right. Was yeah. So it's a similar thing. When you had had that car accident, did you get hospitalized? I just, you know, left concerned, like what happened to you after that oh, car okay. hit you? Okay. Um, well, the voice told me to lay down and cover my face. And I did in the front seat. Uh, but because I did, as the collision unfolded, um, because I was laid down and I didn't have a seatbelt on, and that vehicle then pushed me into the one in front and, you know, sandwiched my vehicle. Uh, I, was, I was then tossed around the car and was in the back seat when the hands picked, the arms picked me up. But even through all of this happening and watching it, my physical body was placed back in the front seat in exactly the same way that I had laid down. So I have no doubt that there was angelic help manipulating my body so that I, that I wouldn't be terribly hurt or injured because um, I, the only thing I felt is because when I was back in the front seat, I didn't even know that I was uh, tossed around the car it was until I saw the pictures because I saw a window shatter in slow motion. And it was the rear window that was, was uh, uh, shattered, not the front window. So I was in the back seat at the time when that window shattered. Uh, but I, I felt like my head was going to explode when I sat up, but then that went away. I, I was, was taken to the hospital. I don't remember the ride to the hospital. I don't remember seeing a doctor, but I know I did. Um, it was until later that day that my spirit actually <laughs> stabilized back in my body. And then the nurses came and told me that uh, if I could find a ride, then I could leave. But that was later in the afternoon, uh, several hours later. So I was saved in that accident. Mm -hmm. um, and I, probably because of all this other stuff that was meant to happen. Absolutely. And the last question is, there must have been a healing because I don't see a slap in yourself. Yeah, no, that, that all went away. I don't get the electrical shocks anymore. But you know, I've read about other, um, other people that had this phenomenon too. And that was the spirit, that was the opening of your, uh, of, of the on, coming on, the awareness of the, uh, your spirit body. Um, because I know the, the, the pastor that we went to listen to that day, I read his book, and that's, he had a spiritual experience when he was younger. And that's through that experience with, with the, the Holy Spirit and Jesus, he got, that's where he got his ability to heal. Um, I didn't know that at the time. And so he, he felt like he was big, had electrical shocks all over his body. Um, Isn't that something? That's what it is. I'm, wow. Um, so where does it continue and how's your son Oh, my son is doing fine. Uh, he, uh, he ended up, it, it, everything was, I looked at because it was, everything was coordinated. In the meantime, you know, after these near-death experiences, um, my, let, my watches started to, to die. I had a pile of watches and, and uh, I had the electrical phenomena going on with the telephones and other things. Uh, um, the telephone would ring periodically. 
And when, and when I was by it and I'd pick it up, nobody was there. And I was really getting irritated, Sandra. Sure. I thought, yeah, I thought, I thought, is he seeing somebody? And she's calling and hanging up on me. Right. So, and that was just about the time that caller ID came out. And so I uh, would immediately call that number back. But every time I called that number back, I got a, that recording of you have reached a well, number that has been disconnected or no longer in service. Please got, you know, check your number and dial again. Uh, now, how can that happen on every one of those calls? You know, there has to, had to be something behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, then um, the silver cord I saw is mentioned in Ecclesiastic. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Another person told me that later on in life. And it says, yes, you remember your creator now while you're young before the silver cord of life snaps and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Uh, and the spiritual community, of course, refers to that silver cord as the tether that secures the spirit body to the physical body and to heaven too. So after this experience, more of the movie moments started happening that he had shown me um, and I didn't know what he wanted me to do. So I knew that I should share the experiences, but I, I evaluated, this is where I evaluated my strengths and my weaknesses. I'm a shy person. Um, and I didn't think I'd be a very good speaker, uh, or nor I would be a, a writer. I thought it would just be too hard. Uh, and so I, I, I frustrated. I said, uh, look, I don't know what you want me to do. Just tell me. And so one night I went to bed and I, again, asked in a prayer. I said, uh, dear Father in heaven, would you please tell me what you want me to do? And if I don't get an answer tonight. I will know that's my answer and I won't have to do anything and <laughs> <laughs> that I could stay in my comfort zone. So, but, so I didn't want an answer. You know, I wanted to stay in my comfort zone like most people do. Uh, but the next morning when I sat up in bed, I heard his voice and he said, make it about me. And that's when he showed me writing a book and talking about it. And he showed me, uh, he was showing me that we have a tendency to set up our own limitations and he doesn't have those same limitations for us. He knows we can do more. And now that's when I had the answer to what I had to do and I had to write the book and that's why Dying to See came to be. Um, yes. So now these were a few moments that God showed me, but every moment, even the ones that you haven't heard about are significant to all of us. Uh, some of the revelations that come from these all these moments, um, one of them will be uh, that we transition to heaven at the right time for us. And as I already mentioned, certain moments will occur no matter what way we take, pathway we take. And we work together with other spirits by teaching or learning with each other. But we always have the free will to bypass the assistance of another spirit. Uh, for example, this is another thing that happened after that he showed me was going to happen because I saw a, a, a panel of, of spiritual beings and uh, Bob, the love of my life was brought into my life from the other side of the world for a special learning experience. And, and if I didn't allow him into my life, I wouldn't have learned that particular lesson in, in the wonderful fashion that I did. Or I, I might have learned in a much different way or not at all. So we have choices. Uh, we not only choose what we like to learn, but we also choose adversities that go to go through because uh, God didn't promise a, a, an easy life. And, and we have the free will to make our bad decisions too. So actually we learn through the dark times uh, more than we do through the easy times, because uh, that that makes the spirit evolve and learn as well as the person. Um, I was brought up to a before a council of beings, like I said, that was one of the visions, and uh, they wanted to know what I learned about judgment. I had learned because Bob. Uh, took me to places in the world where I realized by seeing different cultures and stuff that I had judged people uh, during my childhood. 
and they were happy with what I learned. Um, I because I went through that. They asked me to show them how I learned, and then all my all my memories played across the heavens, and how I formed that judgment, and then how I how I came to decide that I had misjudged. And so we have to always look where our judgments come from. Uh, mine was a misunderstanding. My mom always, uh, when we, after we got home from church or school or something, and we went to play on the bars, you know, and girls like to put their sweater over the bars and twirl and twirl and twirl. And my mom would, she would say, get off there. She said, go put, if you're going to do that, go get some pants on. And so I took that, that everybody needed to be modest, you know, and I right. had people based on their clothing and, and their lifestyle. I went through that too. Uh, but I also learned, learned that words and sentences carry power because it's one sentence that I said that changed my son's life. And when I said that one sentence, I saw a light bulb going on over his head. And he was looking into his bedroom at the time. And I knew that sentence made a connection. I wouldn't have seen that light if I hadn't had this experience because it, it, these kind of experiences kind of push open your, your psychic ability. They do, they do. Yes, they do. And now he's, uh, he, since he, got through everything that he was going through at that time. He's a, a supervisor at a great company and has a beautiful daughter um, and a happy life. So uh, we always have to be use positive words in uplifting because there's also a passage in the Bible that says uh, positive words bear fruit and negative ones make the vine shrivel. So we always need to be aware of our our words because they do carry power and we should always lift people to be the best they can be i was also showed oh like i said that we have a tendency to put up our own limitations just like i did and now i'm an author of a book and i'm speaking so anything can be overcome if we take the steps to get there and i can easily tell everyone that from this experience, I find orbs in photos, very fascinating. <laughs> and people, not only because I turned into an orb, but because the spiritual beings in my NDEs came and left as sparkling light orbs too. And I also found another fascinating in, uh, tidbit of information, Sandra, uh, recently. And, and uh, it's according to the 2016 research uh, at Northwestern Medicine, that a stunning explosion of zinc fireworks occurs when the human egg is activated by a sperm enzyme. The science referred refer to this as a zinc spark. Uh, and Discovery Magazine lists the zinc spark of life as the number 47 of the top discoveries, top 100 discoveries in 2016. And there's a wonderful YouTube video talk that everybody can watch uh, on YouTube and it's with Thomas V. O'Halloran from the Northwest U. His presentation shows the zinc spark activating at the conception. And uh, it's easy to find that on YouTube by uh, searching for Thomas V as in victory, O'Halloran, or simply put in zinc spark and find you find his TED talk. Zinc is in Z-I-N-K? Z-I-N-C, Z-I-N-C. And that, that zinc spark discovery uh, and my experience of turning into an orb when I suffocated indicates that we not only start as a spark of light, but we end as a spark of light or the orb, if, if you will. And, and now I'd like everybody to just think about my story. And while I was out of my body, I still had my thoughts. I still had my memories of who I was in my body. Our spirit consciousness is the real us because our consciousness is housed in our spirit, not the brain. The brain, shall we say, is the motherboard that, it, that uh, operates the physical body, but it's our soul that looks through these eyes of the person that we are. 
So it's my spirit that's talking to Sandra and to, it's your spirit out there that's listening to our spirit, to us. And we, when we read a book, it's our spirit reading the book. So we are talking spirit to spirit. And that's why I know that it, our body works in tandem with each other and the spirit energy moves the body through life. And without the body, the spirit couldn't have a human experience. And this brings me to another subject, and that's my dad's final hour uh, okay. when, when I was uh, notified that his death was going to occur. I had was able to spend the last seven hours with him because I was out of the country at the time. It was my time for a break, and I got the call. I do remember that night because I was out of country. I put myself out, of, out in the universe, and I said, Dad? And he said, Jan, I said, yeah, am I going to make it in time? Because, you know, that's not international travel is not fast. And he said, I'll try, but it'll be close. So I, the universe worked everything out. There was a flight when there normally isn't. I was able to get into Denver at the right time, get catch an earlier flight into Boise and spend the last seven hours with him. And uh, uh, undoubtedly, when the final team time came because I traveled 17 hours and he seemed to be resting peacefully. And I um, took a short nap and I would have been out for a long time, but something woke me up and I woke up around 1.30 in the morning and I, I felt like I should be taking movies. So I started filming my dad's breathing. And I thought that if I, uh, if I had a question, then I could take that film to uh, the nurse and get some questions. But what I happened to do, because mom and dad had during, since they knew about my experiences, they agreed to share with me everything they sensed, felt, experienced in any way during their trek door death. And they were, they were trekking together. They were walking together. And so they shared some fantastic things with me, which will be an in my next book, but this, what happened this at this moment was my dad's last ditch effort to show me what happens on our trek toward death. And because he's an honest man, he always does what he says he will do. And that's when I caught his spirit whipping out of his body when I was filming, he had, he had ex uh, exhaled his last breath. And I was, I continued to film because I thought maybe he'd breathe again, but he never did. But he, they also agreed to let me put these, if I wanted to share these with the world, if they were helpful, I could, and this is. So I, I made a film, Real Spirit Caught Leaving Body, which is on my Janet Tarantino YouTube channel. And when people watch this, I suggest they build the film on a laptop size screen or better. Uh, because the smaller screens eliminate too much detail. And while I was filming dad's uh, breathing, that's when he whips out of the body. But while I was making this film, I know my dad was there because I only say his name, Dick, once during that conversation of telling this story. I was telling a story of a conversation I was having with my mom before she passed over. And just as I said, Dick, in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, we see a, a orb of light dip down into the frame and back out again, exactly when I say Dick. So I know that was my dad coming to show that he, is, he uh, too is an orb of light now, a spirit energy. Janet. So, yeah, and- you, uh, You're I amazing. Huh? <laughs> You're amazing. This is like a breath of fresh air. And I feel too, coming from the, your Christian background, so many people have fought me that believing the afterlife is going against God, going against the Bible, and just to being able to pull out the silver cord and the different things. And I love what you say about um, the positive thoughts and the fruit. And I just thought, it, it's a, it, to me, it occurs as a breath of fresh air, having yeah. you share all this. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great great actually they was very enlightening once i look back on it and that's what i can talk about next if we have time um, yeah how about one more topic and then we'll wrap it up yes okay um sadly we can't understand our life until we look at it in the rearview mirror 
And so I've got some tips for people to realize what they're, uh, what they're here to learn from. They can make their own book of life like I did. Uh, uh, during the planning of this crea creation of this book, I, I created a timeline and uh, put everything, all the moments that stuck out in my mind on this timeline, along with the year, the date, um, the who was in my life at that time, where I was, any pertinent information. And I also put in this thing, the deja vu moments, because those, for some of those who don't know, those are instances where we feel like we've experienced this moment before, and we've been in this particular place before. I believe those memories are our planning for our, our, when, before we came into this little blue planet, planet, just like that panel of spiritual beings made it known that they brought Bob into my life for this particular lesson plan. And like I said, if I had chose not to let him in, I wouldn't have uh, been able to, to do that. Um, so put all those down uh, and the people in the, that were around you at the time, what, what you felt like you were being taught. Example of this is, is the, the education of compassion, empathy, self-respect or self-preservation or strength, love, kindness, or forgive, forgiveness, et cetera, things like that. And then uh, this will take a bit of work, of course, but it will be rewarding and to help you look uh, to see if a, something is cycling over again, over and over again. Um, because if something keeps cycling over and over again, then we have not learned the lesson. Or if we know what the lesson is and we haven't implemented what we need to do to make that stop, then we're going to keep this is keep, going to keep cycling. So, um, and if anybody has problems making this, if they have questions or something, they can always feel free to contact me. And it's uh, to contact me, it's easy, easiest to find me on my JanetTarantino.com website because there I have my contact page that goes directly to my email, which is Janet Tarantino author at gmail.com because you can write me directly. I also have on there uh, my blog that tells about how spirit communicates with us, has all my social media links as well as my uh, the YouTube uh, icon that'll take you directly to my YouTube. So I, I really hope that all of this does help people understand what they're here doing. They may be here helping people or, or learning because our life is the highest and most mystical wonderful adventure that we can ever have so well i'm really grateful that you came back yeah. <laughs> from these experiences and can't thank you enough really like i said a breath of fresh air it's so interesting to hear stories of the afterlife but my thrust underneath everything is it gives us a powerful life when we understand the big picture and i agree a thousand percent that some of the things that we've gone through it's only when we can look back when we can see what we've learned and the toughest times in our life provide i think the most growth for our soul so i am aligned in it i'm you know i'll keep sharing you i want to thank you really thank you for spending this time with us today so glad that you had me I yeah want to know love is the only thing that matters and that's how we should live our life yeah love is a very powerful powerful thing and you know yesterday on our sunday gathering we were talking about love and i'll just sum this up it was a story about a teacher who had made just a huge difference in the world and it was in baltimore 25 years ago something like that that these students had to go research these inner city boys these 200 boys and say, you know, how are they going to make it in life? And these 200 students, these uh, kids doing the, the uh, interviews said they're never going to make it. They're, they're never going to be anybody. I mean, they really were living a tough life. And then 25 years later, a professor at the same college found this earlier research and decided to look to see what ever happened to these 200 boys. Well, there was a number of them that had passed away or not living in the area, but there was something like 176 of them that still lived in the area. So he decided to have his students follow up on, on these boys. Well, they all turned into successful career businessmen, doctors, lawyers, you know, 
all these great things when it was predicted just the opposite would happen. And so they asked, well, you know, what do you attribute to your success? And they each said with so much feeling, there was a teacher. So they found the teacher and the bottom line is they asked what kind of miracle that she did to really make these boys believe in themselves. And she says, all I did was love them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's such a powerful, powerful story. Anyways, I'll leave that with <laughs> everybody. So uh, thank you to Janet. Her website is JanetTarantino.com, or you can find out all kinds of goodies about her. Her book is titled Dying to See, Revelations About God, Jesus, Our Pathways, and the Nature of the Soul. I'm sure there's so much more in the books, the book than she discussed here today. There must be because we're only here for an hour. But in closing, I just want to make a couple of brief announcements. You heard me say at the beginning, our home base is wedontdie.com. There, if you join my email list, you get a free copy of my book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, and also a very healing audio called How to Survive Grief. Grief is something that brings us together, unfortunately. It is painful. There is a way through it. And there's some tools there, but also it can be that thing that gets us on our life purpose. And as painful as it is, again, looking in the rear view mirror, looking back, some of the things that you've experienced, even right now, you're the one to help another person. And you don't have to write a book. You don't have to have a podcast, but you never know who's going to come into your circle and your words will be the difference that they need to hear. Anyways. We, oh, sorry. We also have uh, lots of great things going on. If, um, if you look at our store button or our calendar, we have a couple of really great upcoming medium demonstrations. One is a mediumship called Messages and Portraits, and you'll see one medium hand moving on a paper, whereas another medium, medium who's somewhere else is tapped into the same soul, and you'll hear verbal messages. And also, like I said, free Every Sunday, we have a medium demonstration as part of our our Sunday gathering. So if you hear this soon, you can see that demonstration. If not, there'll be another one coming up. What else do I want to tell you? I think that's it. I think that's it. There's so much more I could say, but I think Janet has left us with so much more. So again, our home base is wedontdie.com. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. Janet, could you just tell us that quote one more time about the fruit and the positive words? Yes. Positive word makes the vine bear fruit and uh, negative words makes the vine shrivel. So powerful. Janet, thank you to you again. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening or for viewing. And we'll see you soon.